Hi, everyone. My name is Ambrielle Turrentine, and I am the Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications for the Destiny City Film Festival. First of all, if you're watching this, thank you so much for joining us and supporting our ninth edition of the festival. And of course, thank you to our special guest from the film Everything in the End. So I will let these two introduce themselves, um, but we can start with Melissa. Yep. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I'm the writer director of the film Everything in the End, which is my first feature. Uh, and I'm Brendan Hubbard. I'm the producer of Everything in the End, and I helped Melissa make her first feature. <laughs> and congratulations on the first feature. That is an amazing feat. So very Thank happy. You. Uh, so my first question is just, can you kind of walk us through the genesis of this film and how it came about? Yeah, sure. So I had spent some time in Iceland and I knew that I wanted to make a movie there. And in 2018, I was invited to participate in the Reykjavik Talent Lab um, in Iceland. And while I was there, really the seed was planted that, um, yes, for sure, I was going to make a movie here. I didn't know what it was going to be at the time, but when I got back at the beginning of 2019, I kind of just started going through a bunch of ideas in my head and, and really landed on the idea of I wanted to make a movie uh, about um, kind of kindness in, in, in people and these human connections that we have and deciding I wanted to do about a film about grief because I felt like that was like a universal thing that everyone could really understand and, and how we grieve and how we need people when we grieve to get us through that process. Um, and the idea was I wanted to put that into context of like everybody was dying. So it was going to take place when um, the last couple of days of earth, but I didn't want to do this big kind of dystopian chaotic movie. I really wanted to do a very quiet film that wasn't necessarily about the end of the world, but more about um, these people um, dealing with dying at the end of the world. So that's where it came about. And so I asked Brendan if he would be interested in coming on. We had worked together before um, on a few projects in the past and I knew I wanted him to be part of the first feature. And so, um, yeah, so that was at the kind of the, you know, beginning of 2019 and somewhere around the September, I finally kind of wrote something down and, <laughs> and then, and then at the end of September, we filmed it in Iceland. So it kind of happened really fast. Once, once we, we decided, yes, we were going to do it. I think like two months later we were doing it. So, yeah. I'm glad you brought up that Iceland was kind of the inspiration for the story, because that was one of my other questions, whether the story came first or the location came first, since location does seem to be very uh, central to this story. But mm -hmm. I will get back to that question in a little bit. I did want to ask just kind of how did you assemble this multinational cast and crew and how did the, that whole thing come together? Yeah, I mean, once Brendan came on board, um, um, it basically was, I knew it was going to be my first feature and I knew we didn't have a lot of money. And what was really important to me was to work with people that I knew and work with people that I trusted and had worked with in the past, but also people who it was time for them to also make a first feature or make another feature. Um, and so I felt that if it was going to be something really low budget and really fast, that the people that I were going to surround myself with we're going to be those people who are just um, as as wanting as much as I did to make it. And so uh, we only have a four person crew. And so, yeah, so I, I definitely had to choose people that I, I really um, had wanted to work with for a while and who I've known for a very long time. So once I kind of convinced those four people to kind of do this journey with us, um, I uh, Hugo came along. Uh, he was an actor that I saw in another movie that a friend had did. And I really needed this idea of a foreigner stranded in a foreign place. Um, and I had liked what he did in a, this other movie. And so I asked him if he'd be interested and he said, yes. And then from there, it was just a matter of Brendan and I really kind of figuring out well, who do we get in Iceland? How do we get in casting in Iceland? And it was a lot of, uh, googling trying to figure out how that all works and but we all went there we we only had uh we had a producer in iceland who was very like um instrumental in helping us understand how to film in iceland and then we just cast people based on they have like a database of actors and so we just emailed people and asked them and sent them the script and we were just really lucky that that they said yes so um, but the crew itself all, all came from here in the United States. And it, it's people that Brendan and I had worked with on multiple other films. And so 
um, getting the crew was actually not as hard as I thought it was going to be. Getting the actors was harder. Um, getting the money was harder, but like, yeah, the crew, I mean, everyone wanted to go to Iceland really. So <laughs> and on the money note, I'm curious, did you, um, did you have any reservations or run into any issues regarding location? Did you ever have to think, oh, maybe Iceland isn't going to work because of our budget? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, I, I made the task pretty much impossible for Brendan. I was like, I'm going to crowdfund and whatever we get, that's what we're going to make the movie for. Um, and so uh, when we first started out, we were like, we could get these really cheap tickets to Iceland through Wow Air. But somewhere within that month of us getting ready to book those tickets, Wow Air went bankrupt. So it went from spending like $100 on tickets to, you know, quite a lot more on tickets. Um, and Iceland's extremely expensive, but I think the key that, you know, Brendan and I and Todd, the DP, is like, we really, really prepared for every kind of scenario. Like we really discussed it a lot. Like, well, we only have this much money, so we don't have a lot of, lo we can't have a lot of locations. So we can't have a lot of this and we can't have a lot of that. I mean, it's like indie film. It's like you either need more time or more money. And, and unfortunately we needed both, but we all knew that going in. And so, knowing that you have those obstacles going in means that you really prepare for it. So, you know, I think we did, I booked a place on Airbnb for us to stay. And I just like did a Google earth, like what's within two miles of us. And we'll just find those will be our locations. And we really, really lucked out because the locations that were already in the script were literally within walking distance of where we were staying. So we, we lucked out. So, yeah. That's awesome. And Brendan, do you have anything to add and um, just kind of talk about your your approach to this film, especially as it relates to the location? Uh, well, basically, my approach was wherever we're sleeping, we also need to be able to utilize as a shooting location. Uh, and yeah, like Melissa said, like if if most of those locations weren't in the same place we were sleeping, then it would have been a completely different film. We wouldn't have had the time to travel because anywhere you go in Iceland, you know, it's 45 minutes to an hour. So that was just key that we found the perfect place in the perfect little town. And, you know, I guess the other part of the money front was we, we had flown in one of the actors from Spain who also was our chef, which that very much helped us. Cause if we were buying pizzas in Iceland, it would have been insane. So in-house chef, always a good suggestion for an indie film. <laughs> That's Raul. Raul, I actually met in Iceland at the talent lab and, and he came in last minute as an actor and he had done a movie in Iceland already. And so he was just like, I'll do anything. I'll just, just get me there and I'll do anything. And flying from Spain was, was cheaper than flying from, you know, the United States. And then, so he flew in to be in it. And then he said, I'll stay and I will be your guys's like craft service slash, you know, I'll make all your dinners at night. Cause he wanted to be there and he wanted to, and he, and it saved us completely. Cause originally Brendan and I were like, we'll work all day. We'll prep meals at night. We'll cook for everybody. And we were trying to figure out how to divide those tasks up because everyone was living together. And so, uh, and yeah, Raul came in and he saved us. Also, he's like incredibly lovely and nice and everyone fell in love with him. And so um, it was nice to have him around. He was a very calming presence. So he was just a nice guy. So um, yeah, definitely when you work with the budget like we had, which is basically no budget, <laughs> Uh, anyone who kind of wants to be involved in the film usually we wears more than one hat and and it's really you know because otherwise it's just another mouth to feed if they're there not doing and and so it becomes a little bit stressful so but yeah I mean Brendan was a producer but he was also like a gaffer and a grip and like doing you know driving people and and so he, he kind of had a lot of roles and then learned how to drive stick yeah for the first time in a parking lot in Iceland, he learned how to drive a stick. So yeah, it was great. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we're talking about location. Obviously this film, I think, um, you know, the landscapes in Iceland that you capture are obviously very stunning. And I think they really aid to the general atmosphere of the film because, you know, it could be peaceful for some, but in this story it does seem to kind of isol or um, emphasize the isolation these characters feel and, you know, why they feel so driven to human connection. So could you just talk about in your own words, um, either of you or both of you, just the role that location played in the story itself? 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of landscape, it's it's not hard to make Iceland look bad. I mean, I mean, look at Instagram. Everyone looks like they're having an amazing time there. But, you know, weather was a big issue and we knew that. So we wanted to implement that weather into our, our script. And I had talked a lot about how that weather actually it's a key in the water and the wind and the rain are key to like a foreshadowing of what's to be coming. Um, but also it kind of really is sets an emotional tone of where the characters are in, internal. That weather is like kind of a representation of that. So that kind of chaos that's kind of going around within this, these beautiful landscapes um, are two things that I felt like were a benefit. So I know it's a little bit cliche for people to say, you know, like, oh, your locations are your, you know, your fourth character. Um, but really Iceland is a, a huge character in, in the film. And that weather is like another huge character in the film. And so we knew, we knew what was going to happen. We, you know, we said it's going to get dark at three. So we're, it's just, we just shoot whatever we shoot and we shoot in the night, we shoot in the dark. Um, and it's going to get cold and it's going to get rainy and it's going to be windy and it's going to be a little bit, you know, but I, we felt, or I felt anyways, that it's supposed to be the end of the world. And it's supposed to be a little bit like time is a construct. We don't care what day it is. We don't care if it's night or day. We don't care what's going on around us. What we care about, what those characters care about is, Hey, this is all going to end in a couple of days. And I just want to be outside as much as I can or have these human connections as much as I can. I don't need to worry about changing my clothes. I don't need to worry about, you know, brushing my teeth because I'm going to be dead in a couple of days. And so um, once you kind of strip all that kind of stuff away, that would go, that continuity stuff that would go in a script, um, it's quite actually freeing and easier to do a movie when you don't have to worry if it's midnight or day and in the script or, if, you know, continuity of clothing and if the weather's bad. And so basically we just said make sure you pack clothes that are going to work in wet weather and so and i don't think any of us really did except for the sound um persons she's the only one that was fully prepared for wet weather so <laughs> and how many days did you shoot the film over brendan N nine <laughs> yeah nine days and then we were gone 11 total because of travel but then we lost half a day because the airline lost our gear. So eight and a half. Wow. Okay. Well, eight and a half days and no budget in a four person crew. That's wildly impressive. So again, I am very blown away by that. <laughs> Congratulations again. And then on the, um, still kind of on the topic of the landscapes, you know, like I said, the, there's the natural beauty of Iceland, but I think the beauty is extended throughout the film with um, various shots and various intimate shots. So I'm kind of curious, could you talk about the cinematography and how that was crafted? Yeah, so Todd Hickey, who is the DP, he, him and I go way back. We've known each other since we were like 18. And his background primarily is uh, documentary filmmaking. And so um, we approached this film as if we were documentarians, because that's what my background is too. So we talked a lot about how um, we wanted to uh, make sure that the intimate moments were uh, later on in the script because we wanted the Paolo, the main character to, we wanted to feel his isolation. Um, so everything in the beginning is these beautiful wide shots with these big landscapes, but he's this kind of tiny little figure. And then as he moves through and processes all these stages of grief is when people start coming into his world. And then that's when it ends up like at these very intimate moments with him. So we kind of, once we kind of decided that we were going to follow an emotional trajectory, um, uh, crafting those shots and doing that shot list was a little bit more easier for us because we both come from a background of documentaries, but I also do photography and we've worked together before. And so he knows that I like things very specific and, and, and very composed in my shots, but also I like things very still. Um, and he likes to, sh he, he's not a big handheld person. So he likes to shoot things very still as well. And we felt like that kind of language is really what we're trying to say in this movie, like slow down and, and really take up these last moments in life 
and and we wanted those shots to really reflect that. Um, and we have like a little playbook. We had um, a book that really kind of a lookbook that we both had made together. And we had like a shot list that was very specific for emotional beats. So the shot list wasn't just everything throughout the movie. And there were no, I mean, we had tiny little storyboards for just, you know, a couple lines in that scene that we knew we wanted it to be that way. And so, um, and, you, and we had to prepare for that pretty fast are very detailed because we knew it was going to be such a fast uh, shoot and we knew we weren't going to have time for setups and we knew um, that we just wanted to like let those actors breathe in those scenes and so there's not a lot of movement um, for for those reasons you know that are all listed and so we wanted to make um, everything kind of quiet and so and, and it forces people to kind of lean in again, again, to see what they're watching in a way. So, yeah. yeah. My next question was actually going to be about the quietness and the sound design. Uh, is there anything you anything else you want to touch on there or do you think you kind of covered it? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad that everyone has been bringing up the sound design because I think Kirby did a really great job. Um, I approached her and I said, I, I want to make this movie in Iceland and I want to make a very quiet movie with like not a lot of sound, which is like a weird thing to say to a sound person. And so, but I said, I need it to sound like Iceland and I need it to sound like this kind of loomingness. And so she was really great. She came in and we'd see her off in like the field, like recording like the wind or recording just like the, the, the reeds going through the, you know, on the fields or the sound of water was pretty important to me. And those, that sound is kind of laced throughout the whole entire movie. And then Darren, who Brendan is uh, brought on, he does, he does like the music and him and I had spoke about still using these sound elements that he she did and incorporate it into the music that he did and he did such a I mean like I think it's like he did a pass at something and then it was like oh that's 90 percent there and then I gave a few notes and then he came back and I was like yeah that's it and then he knew exactly where to put those those moments with that music to really kind of level up and enhance everything and it was really awesome I I'd never really worked with a composer before so I wasn't sure of how to do that and how the language, but Brendan's kind of key for that. Cause I mean, that's kind of his, you know, background a little as well. So he brought on Darren and I was like, great. Can you do every movie now? <laughs> so, And he will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but just, you know, I was sending Kirby away into the field so she, that she didn't get mad at us about, you know, all the noises on set. Cause a lot of, a lot of times we'd use like a car as a dolly and, what happens with cars in in uh, Iceland is they all have like screws in the wheels to deal with the, the ice. The studs, yeah. Yeah, the little studs. So like every, she would just be constantly in my ear, like the sound's gonna sound crappy, or we're, you know, there's forty mile per hour winds and rain, and she's like, well, no one's gonna be here or anything, or the actors are bundled in seven layers, and she's like, I'm not getting good audio, and I was like, just go in a field and have fun. We'll <laughs> figure this all out. She did a great job. She she did the mix and post, so so she knew what she was up against, and uh, I'm I'm really I'm happy, and I'm I hope she's happy with it. I mean, there was a there was one scene where we really struggled in post because of the sound, but we did the best that we could do. But overall, I feel like the way she kind of weaved in the the sound of Iceland is very is very Iceland. So. Yeah. And going back to something you said earlier, you mentioned your um, your background as a documentarian. And there were a few scenes where I kind of felt like, I don't know, just felt that I think the immediacy and the maybe immersive nature of the scenes felt like I was in them almost as if it were a documentary. And uh, some of those scenes um, were later in the film with the um, more the, the local actors. So I wanted to ask you, I, I read that there were, I, I hate calling them non-professional actors, but there are more and less experienced actors. So could you talk about your experience with them? Uh, I mean, overall, my experience with all the Icelandic actors were really great. Um, Iceland's like really a big theater community. And so when we were originally reaching out to people, everyone didn't really have a lot of film experience, except for like one of the main guys. He had the, he's like in everything. And so um, and then but most of them, like the older woman, Lilia, who plays Anna, she's like a theater actress and she had, has done some TV. So they were kind of the more experienced ones, but 
you know, even Hugo, the lead actor, he'd only done two films that were like uh, him and his friend had did together. And um, so this was kind of like a new role for him in a, in a bigger production and like people he didn't know that he he'd never worked with. And the kid had never done anything. And the woman who plays the mom, she had only kind of done a few short films, like two or three. Um, and so this was like her first feature. And then um, the other people just they were not actors that we that maybe at one point they might have done like community theater here and there, but they hadn't done films or TV at that point. And so, um, and, you know, Raul's, he's not acted. He's, I mean, he was in his own film that he did, but other than that, you know, it was a big step for him and his English is not that great either. And so, but I, I, it was, they were all really easy. Like the kid who couldn't even speak English, he had never done anything. And he was just so happy to be there. And, I thought that, you know, working with them and I tend to always work with like non-actors or first time actors. So it's like a language that I know already how to communicate with them. And so more than anything, it was what I had to learn in directing was like theater language is different from uh, film language. So I in just in terms of talking and communicating with the older actors who are in the movie is like how to translate. Well, I know they do that in theater, but they don't do that in film. So I need to figure out how to let them know what I need for them. But generally it was relatively easy. And, and everyone in Iceland is really lovely and calming and they're just they're super chill. So, um, and they're, they're, they're game and they're open to try anything. And so, so just having them around, um, it didn't, it wasn't so stressful. So, and they're also only there for one day. Like we would bring the actors in, they would shoot their scene and then they would leave the next day and then the next one would come in. And so it was constant like evolving or revolving actors for Hugo. And so they would come in and we would do like a quick rehearsal the night before and they wake up in the morning and shoot and then they would leave that night. So there wasn't a lot of time that we got to spend with them. So I think the time that we did spend with them um, was like very, like everyone was hyper-focused on it, so. And one of the themes of the film deals with, you know, craving human connection and feelings of grief and loss. And I did want to ask, because this was shot pre-pandemic, correct? Correct. So did did the ex your experience of the pandemic, which, you know, is still ongoing, but did that kind of maybe change how you identify with or how you read the story now? I mean, yeah, we shot it at the end of 2019 and then we went through the holidays. So we didn't really start editing it till um, mid January. And our editor, Nicole, she kind of had like a, an assemble rough cut at the beginning of February. And so then we really started getting notes and like how we were going to do it. It was a totally different film at that point. Um, and then pandemic hit and, you know, Los Angeles, we went into a complete lockdown. So we did all of our posts like this over Zooms and over text messages and emails and like phone calls, trying to figure out how we, we were going to make this work without any of us actually seeing or meeting each other or being in the same room. And I think the longer the, the, that those first kind of uh, initial five months in 2020, the more things started happening around us, the more it really did kind of change our views and inform us a little bit how the film was being edited. And we, we, we would make jokes like, oh, who knew that we were going to predict, you know, everyone was going to be isolated in their houses and dying at the end of the world. And then all of a sudden, like, sh shit was getting really, were really real in the real world. And we were like, oh, uh oh. So, um, yeah, I think I think more than anything, I think I knew and I was very clear about what kind of film I wanted going in. But I think what's happened is because of the pandemic and people watching the movie, they're, they now relate to it more in a different way because they're experiencing the film. Uh, it's a little bit more relatable to them, I think. But also, I thought like I was going to be making this really super depressing film about death. And really, a lot of people have come back to us saying that this is a really hopeful film and it's made them like more, um, you know, introspective considering everything going on in the world still. But like they're, they very much 
took a different um, uh, attitude towards it rather than just it being this really depressing movie. I don't know. Brendan, how do you feel? <laughs> I mean, same thing you're saying. I mean, this we went we went into this movie thinking we were making a depressing, you know, pseudo dystopian movie. And then by the end of pandemic, it's like, oh, we made something really beautiful and like we can all come together one day and watch it and all that stuff. I mean, I, I didn't see Melissa for close to two years before we got to sit in a theater together. And it was one of those like emotional moments to see this beautiful thing we created that th at the start of it, we thought we we're making something dark and dreary and, you know, people aren't going to respond to it the way they did. And then pandemic really helped us out. So <laughs> silver lining, I guess. <laughs> silver lining. And then I always, I always like to ask, was there anything about the film, any anecdotes or really anything about the film that I might not think to ask about that you'd like to share? This can literally be anything. Um, God, that's like a really good question. And I'm a hundred percent not prepared for that kind of question. I mean, you kind uh, of I covered guess, all the bases. I guess one interesting thing, you know, from my end being the, the producer with no money and no time, we ended up adding a character and a full scene amongst those eight and a half days of shooting. So that's always an interesting thing. Uh, basically the, the character on the beach, uh, we added him later. Uh, he was actually the husband of our Icelandic producer. And we just really, I don't know, Melissa saw him and really wanted him to be in the movie. So she wrote a whole nother scene. The night before, and then he came in to visit and we put him in a movie. And he was gung ho, and it's one of my favorite scenes. So the one on the beach where they're fighting. So, yeah. So yeah, you can do it, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And I feel like this conversation has really been—I um, don't know—it's been really enlightening for me, just regarding the filmmaking process and especially indie filmmaking and all the limitations and restrictions that you um, ended up dealing with and dealing with them very well. So once again, very impressed with that. But last question for both of you is just any projects on the horizon that you can share some news about? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like everybody else, I've spent the last two years trying to figure out what am I supposed to do next and having all these kind of starts and stops because of the pandemic. And so, um, there's a script that I that I read recently that I really like that, you know, Brendan and I are discussing and seeing if that's like the next step for me. Um, and just I think, you know, the biggest kind of frustration that's come out of all this is that, you know, I did the movie not with these really high expectations, but I did this movie to say, hey, look what I can do. And would meeting people and saying, would you like to do something with me? Um, and you meet those people at festivals. And because most of our festivals have been virtual, um, we kind of missed out on the opportunity to meet a lot of people that would kind of figure out and help us with the next steps. And so I think I'm still in a what's next, what's going on. But I, I did, I have landed on a script that I really like. And I think that I'm hoping that that is something that, you know, I could possibly go into pre-production by the end of this year. Other than that, just making movies with my friends and keep on writing. And Brendan and I wrote a script that we've kind of sent out into the world. Um, and we'll see. And I know Brendan's, I keep bugging him to do some directing stuff. So we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, generally just like I have all these things, I'm just going to throw them at the wall and see which ones stick. And hopefully there are uh, people out there who have seen my movie who are, who are like, yeah, I'd like to do something with them and, and kind of contact me. So we'll see. And Brendan, anything on your plate you'd like to share? Uh, yeah. So over pandemic, I've been working in podcast world. So we're about ready to drop a, a narrative based audio series uh, with Amazon in about three weeks. Can't really say who the big cast is yet but it's pretty keep an big eye on it. <laughs> It'll be called American hostage. Okay. It'd be good. That's it. A bunch of movies with Melissa wrote five or six scripts. One day I'll make them. 
<laughs> great. And I'm glad that you mentioned a podcast because I was actually thinking that your mic sounds very crisp and just great. So awesome to hear that. Um, so yeah, we will keep an eye out on that. And Melissa, of course, feel free to share your work whenever, whenever it is um, available. And we will love to stay in contact with you all. Thank you so much for joining. Again, it's been a great conversation. I really appreciate your time and your willingness to share your film with us and the audiences that we have. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. And, and thank you to the festival and really looking forward to hearing everyone's responses to the film. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.